Welcome to another episode of Tales from the Tables with your host, Rob Radley, John Charles Ciccarelli, James Burroughs, and Damian Hallwood. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tales from the Tables. This is your host, Rob, and I'm joined as always by James, JC, and Damian. Hello, hello. hello. How are we all hello. doing, guys? Greetings. All well? Yeah. Good. It's nice to have you back, Rob. Yeah, oh, it's nice. To, what do you mean? What do you mean? I've, I've not been anywhere. <laughs> He's been here the whole time. Yeah, I was just writing notes, listening to you, James, being like, hmm, this is some training for James. Yeah, just to, to do this, maybe do this. I've got like, an old, big old scroll that goes all the way to the back of my office. Just like, yep. Yeah. Yeah, fire James at the end. <laughs> so, uh, Rob, you've you've clearly finished Mass Effect now. Um, yeah, how clearly, was it? Yep. Yeah, how was that? It was an emotional experience. Um, uh-huh. Yep. Excellent. I uh, Excellent. I can't I can't get it on my Steam Deck. No, what? no. How I, can, come? I, I, can, I can get it on here. I can get it on the, on Steam. Well, so it's Epic Games, isn't it? It's not Steam. It's Epic Games. You have to go through. Uh, oh. Is it Epic Games or is it the? Um, it's one of them, basically. Because it's the Steam Deck, you have to use Steam games unless you have like this like ridiculous thing where you hack it up and you like go through this and that, which I'm not yeah. really prepared to do at the moment because I don't really know enough about Linux to start messing around with it. Because I'm yeah. worried if I if I start like playing around with it and then like mess it up, right. Right. I've then lost my Steam Deck. So, yeah, yeah, I've just basically been playing Farming Simulator and Microsoft Flight Simulator as always and yeah <laughs> basically basically doing doing like simulation work games it's yeah. bizarre yeah. i work and then i play a game that's also work <laughs> it's like it's such a bizarre thing hey hey how I, you guys I doing finally Good returned weeks? to doom eternal after doom the dark ages got a really great trailer uh with one of the gnarliest looking weapons i've ever seen if you've seen that trailer you know the one i'm talking about yeah it I is do. a gun that grinds up skulls and turns them into bullets Oh, um, nice! And it's just awesome. <laughs> so it, I, it I couldn't. Yeah, okay. we, we we ran out of other things to think about, guys. Now we <laughs> yeah. have to grind some bones. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the meeting in their offices? Uh, this guy's like, guys, guys, guys. I got this great idea for a weapon. I go, hit me out, hit me out, hit me out. He like does like a, gets gets like the whiteboard and he goes, okay. So imagine a gun, right? That like chews up people's skulls and <laughs> turns their skull fragments into bullets. What do you think, uh, Susan? What do you think? Is this a good idea? Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we have we do have a lot of skulls, and we do need a lot of bullets. So if there's a way to combine those two it things, solves I those do. problems. You guys are crazy. I think it's awesome. <laughs> it is. It is awesome. It is awesome. It's totally awesome. It's just. It's just. It's just. I always find it bizarre trying to like visualize when someone presents this idea because someone has to come up with that idea, or a group of people collectively come up with it. A picture. Yeah, I yeah. think it was probably picture. more. Yeah. I think it was picture. probably like, closer to, yeah. guys. I've got this really metal idea. Get this right. <laughs> and they didn't even get the yeah, finish telling yeah, them what it was. It. And they were just like, they're yeah, they're all, right, all, yeah, they're they're obviously all off the freaking heads yeah. to do it. Do you know what I mean? He's very self-aware, kind of of himself, especially now. Um, yeah. It's very, it's very aware that that's ridiculous, and that's why it gets yeah. a pass because it's. Yeah. It's doing it because it knows it's trying to be a heavy metal album. It's a well. bit tongue in cheek, yeah. Basically, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. almost like that. Um, what was it called? Like the junk loader gun in Fallout, whatever it's called. Damon, you would know oh, the, yeah. junk the, jet. the junk jet. The junk jet. jet. That was a great idea. Just basically, what <laughs> yeah. what? Oh, we need another gun that's more unique and shows off more of this universe. Why not one where you can literally shove anything into it and oh, shoot wow. it as a projectile? Shoot it as, hu- as high pressure as possible. it made it into possible. the show. <laughs> it did make it into the show beautifully oh, as gosh. well. <laughs> really have, well you, have any of you guys ever used um, or allowed guns in your games? In yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I try to avoid it, but I, I have when I ran, I think I ran a Spelljammer game and I allowed guns in that because it made sense for the saying. But yeah, okay. I try and make it few and far between, but if there's any element of like a spell jammer, I think I had the GIF race in one of my campaigns and they hired this. The, the GIF, for those of you that don't know, are the hippopotamus folk and they're styled after sort of Napoleonic era war soldiers, um, highly decorated uniforms, that sort of thing. So all of them carry muskets and, and, uh, and you know, black powder pistols and stuff. So it was, okay, it was cool. fun. Yeah. Do, they, do they call it black powder? They don't call it gunpowder. No, I think they call, they what do they call powder. it specifically? 
Flintlocks, I think it's it might be termed in the DMG. Oh, blund- I mean, blund- they look like blunderbusses. I've seen the artwork they're carrying. You can like get a blunderbuss as well. Yeah, you can get a blunderbuss. Yeah. yeah, they have regular flintlock pistols as well. I think cool. they call it black powder pistols. Yeah, that's or, that's or always gun renaissance. I think is actually how it's yeah. described in the DMG. <laughs> that's renaissance. always a strange because it's D and D is always a kind of mashup between more medieval fantasy and sort of the Age of Sail with right. you know. Right. Tall ships and gunpowder weaponry, and that ever so slightly more technologically advanced uh, setting. It's it always melds those, and it's it's people. It's a lot of people's favorite thing is having a big old right. pirate ship and sailing across the ocean and fighting krakens and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that always fascinates me the the mix of historical uh, eras that D yeah. is made up of. Mm. Same, same. Yeah, I never really thought about it, but yeah, you're right. As soon as you step into sort of any sort of ship to ship stuff, you immediately go, yeah, Age of Sail, pirate style uh, boats and and things like that. You don't really tend to stick to like Viking long ships and yeah, and well, obviously like you you can and people do, but much more popular is the sort of yeah, Age yeah of Sail, three three masted frigate frigates and yeah, yeah it's right. Greetings, fellow adventurers. Are you tired of using subpar tables for your epic tabletop quests? Absolutely. We need something that matches the grandeur of our adventures. Well, fear not, dear listeners. Allow us to introduce to you Robert Rose Carpentry. Established for 10 years as a specialist in crafting bespoke gaming tables that are as functional as they are beautiful. Built to precision, with custom add-ons and exclusive features, 100% sustainable and environmentally friendly, Every inch of their gaming tables are made from reclaimed wood and crafted into a solid masterpiece that will last aeons. And here's the best part. As proud sponsors of Tales from the Tables, Robert Rose Carpentry are offering an exclusive 10% discount to all our listeners. Imagine the thrill of transforming your dining table into a custom-built gaming experience for you, your friends, and your family. To enjoy with custom add-ons and exclusive features. Don't wait any longer. Head over to www.robertrosecarpentry.com each of their gaming tables are made from reclaimed wood from the and crafted into a solid masterpiece that will last aeons. And to here's the best part. Check As proud sponsors craft of Tales from the Tables, Robert Rose Carpentry are offering an exclusive 10% for? discount to all our listeners. Thanks to Imagine the thrill of transforming your dining table into a custom-built gaming experience for you, your friends, and your family to enjoy time and time again. So don't wait any longer. Head over to www.robertrosecarpentry.com forward slash tales from the tables and use the code RollDark10 to claim your discount at checkout. Craftsmanship, adventure, and savings. What more could you ask for? Thanks to Robert Rose Carpentry for supporting our podcast and enhancing our gaming experiences. Absolutely. Now let's roll those dice and weave some epic tales. Indeed. Until the next time, adventurers. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Oh. So, um, with those frigates, then, do you have cannons on them? Or do you have mm, uh, harpoons? No. Hi, I do harpoons. I tend to do, yeah, ballista, uh, occasionally catapults, which Spelljammer, uh, all, most of the ships that they have included in that use those weaponry. They don't use the, the cannons and things like that. So, it's, it's already sort of there for you to, for you to use. Is Spelljammer yeah. like? Is it like uh, lasers and that kind of stuff, like plasma, right? Plasma beam rifles and that kind it of. There can be, but not yeah. necessarily. But the I best, the best official... way I've seen anyone ever describe it was, if you've seen Treasure Planet, then it's basically that. It's oh, right. it's yeah, kind of okay. Age of Sail fantasy without the the modern sci fi take on anything, where it's it, it's almost quasi steampunk, but not quite. Um, right. there's a mechanical and sort of still primitive element to the, to the gunfighting without it, you know, evolving to lasers and that sort of weaponry. But that being said, there, there are spell jammer bits and, and I'm sure I, other people run this and even in Icewind Dale, there's technically a creature with a laser pistol as, uh, as some of us know that you can find. So yeah, it's, I didn't uh, know it's a little, it's a little mix of everything, man. That's what yeah. D&D is all about. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because obviously you can just put in whatever you want. As long as you sort of justify it yeah. based on its history and so on and yeah. so forth. Like, it as a matter of fact, I've got a challenge. I've got a friend who wants to get his wife into the game, 
and <laughs> was <laughs> saying, oh, but they're not really, they don't really buy into the sci-fi and fantasy angle of it very much. So do you think <laughs> it could be, do you think it could be something just more like a murder mystery in the criminal justice system, uh, a whodunit? And I was like, yeah, great idea. And I had this idea of like, I have this, um, we were talking about ships. I have this whodunit aboard a sailing ship that I had styled for D&D. &D, and I was like, maybe I can bring this into the modern day. And I was like, how do they feel about a period piece? And they were like, no, they, they really just want a modern day because they'll want cell phones and stuff like that. And I said, okay, all right. I can take 5e and make the Arcana skill relevant somehow. Make it technology <laughs> instead of Arcana or something. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. would work. That would totally work. Yeah, I think so. I mean, 5e is used for any sort of setting. Yeah. So, yeah, it can be done. It's a I, flexible I, I, system. I've often toyed with an idea of creating a um, a corporate D and D sort of game where basically it would appeal to because um, because obviously as you guys know I come from the corporate world and I've, I used to work in central London and and when I first started Roll Dark like I used to get glazed looks looks over people's faces when I used to explain to them what I was doing or even if I was playing D and D they would just be like you know they'd all take the piss out of me and be like oh yeah rob oh, you nerd all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but but i know but i know for a fact that whenever it came to any kind of uh team building event or team building exercise or anything like that the stuff that we'd always be presented with just would just be absolute shit and would never be fun really and no wow. one enjoyed it and i'd always be like if we just did D, &D it'd be so interesting but to get everybody on board with it you'd have to have it so for example you'd all be detectives trying to solve a um I don't know, like a murder mystery type thing, like a mm -hmm. serial killer. Mm -hmm. um, or you'd have a courtroom drama. You could do like a courtroom drama, that type of thing. Or some kind of like corporate espionage type setup type thing, where it's like a, like a huge takeover that's, that's happened or, right. or something along those lines. And I always thought that if you could take or like 5e, some sort of like corporate heist where you're trying to like steal yeah. the data drives from the rival company or something. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Or you try and derail like, a big like event that's happened or or whatever like it's, it's there's definitely right. legs for it i'm sure of it it's just um i've never had the headspace to go right this is what we're gonna do we do this yeah I think what, a, cool. what a bummer that that people in the corporate world kind of glaze over like you said when you you talk about 5a yeah like, not not everyone or, not everyone, or D, &D or, or anything yeah, right not everyone it was just it was just the the, the majority of them were like that so like you know we go to the pub after work on a friday and it would just be football, 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 mm. football chat. And I'd be there. I'm, you know, I like, I like football, but I'm not, I get bored of talking about it for too long. And sure. there's only so much of it that I can really stomach until I'm just like, meh, you know, <laughs> and, and there's, and there's, and yeah, but there's the guys that I was working with were like, literally, that's all they cared about was that. Right. And right. it was tricky to kind of go. I don't know. It's just tricky to sort of. I just, I just, I just remember thinking, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? I don't belong here. Mm. <laughs> you know, this is not my people. You're, you're nerd. Let your I'm nerd freak flag fly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, do you think that in the years, in the recent years, say in like the past five or six, with the advent of you know the the movie with Chris Pine and all this other stuff going on, it, it gaining so much traction and popularity, has that kind of changed in people that aren't your typical or live and work in your typical nerd spaces or do more people know what it is i personally don't think it has because mm. lord of the rings was so incredibly massive mm -hmm. that you'd have thought that would have been the tipping point for these people if they right. were if they, if they were ever gonna go into it and be like whoa and i think that i think there's a few people that probably watched lord of the rings and thought oh my god that's incredible right and even to the point where some people didn't even realize they were watching fantasy, would you believe? You know, they just thought they were watching Lord of the Rings, believe it. this right. epic think, film. Oh, I think Game yeah. of Thrones did uh, was was a very similar position. Yeah. Where yeah, totally. I know I know people that didn't were not interested in fantasy at all. Watched Game of Thrones for the yeah, first time. Like you're right, James. Like, like middle aged women that like I worked with who previous to Game of Thrones were just not interested in fantasy at all. We're like, oh, I, I really, I really enjoy Game of Thrones. I'm really into it, and they'll religiously like watch it. And I'd come into work on a Monday morning, and they'd be there chatting away about Game of Thrones. And the, <laughs> well, the, fun, the, yeah. the, fun, the funny thing is, cool. is, it, is it doesn't really matter what the setting is or what's or what the theme is in storytelling. All that matters is the story and the characters. Yeah. That's sure. it. Like yeah. you could literally, you could literally get Game of Thrones 
take it out of out of medieval fantasy land, put it into a into a modern day setting, and everyone that loved the Game of Thrones in that setting would still love it in this setting because yeah. of the fact that it's about yeah, the story interesting characters, characters, interesting story. Yeah. That's it. Yep. You know? And that's where I think a lot of people they go, Oh, I don't like fantasy. Probably they haven't watched the right kind of fantasy to really enjoy it. You know? And I yeah. think fantasy suffered from like low production value previously. Hmm. Where it's it's one of those things that it's very easy to make it look shit on TV and film. Like if the costuming <laughs> isn't exactly on point, <laughs> yeah. or your yeah, filming yeah. locations, you or the actors are, like, are dreadful, ideal, or you haven't got. The what do you best mean? Actors. The Sword of Truth series was great, you guys. Jeez. <laughs> or no, I'm sorry. What was it called? The Legend of the Seeker. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was top notch. There's high there's, production value. <laughs> there was one uh, Netflix. <laughs> fantasy uh tv show that i saw a while ago i think it was the serranas or the serranas chronicles or something oh um do you know what i'm on about, about. shannara chronicles, chronicles? Shana- yeah, that's, that's chronicles. it yeah shannara chronicles yeah. I've, yeah. I've read the i've read the books and the books are great but this this tv show it had clearly had a big budget clearly had some great actors in it mm. but it but there was one or two of them of the actors that you could tell weren't fans of fantasy because when oh, they were really? deli- when they were delivering their lines, and they were talking about the dragon, beast of Agnaroth and the fire that he breathes, or whatever they were saying, it was like seems ridiculous to them. You could see yeah. in their performance that they didn't believe. Oof. It. Is that what went wrong with that show? Because I tried watching it for a couple of episodes, and I was like, everything seems in place, but I can't get hooked for some reason. I yeah, think it's not believing it in the story. They just don't I believe guess. it. I tried to watch it. I think the problem I had it it was it seemed too clean. Like mm. I don't I don't mm. I don't know how exactly to like put that into words. Right. Where uh, I right. think I think I know just, what you mean. It's yeah. almost like a like a CW show where everything's very shiny and pristine yeah. and right. It, when it, you felt, think medieval, it wasn't you grounded think, in, in. Yeah, it yeah. didn't seem grounded enough. There's there's a t- there's a film called Elle's Tree. 79 i think it is about star wars about the making of the first star wars film obviously it came out there's a new hope um, by george lucas and it's interviewing all the um all the extras that are in it right and this one extra he turns up he says he's basically he's being interviewed and he says so i turned up on set on the day and i'm looking at all this space gear and i can see like there's carbon scoring on this one there's like marks on this stuff there's like loads of like dirt and things all on this like really futuristic looking gear and he said he said as soon as i saw that it's like i knew that we were dealing with something incredible that that yeah. um, whoever whoever had made this had thought about the reality of it and believed in it you know because like to do that like you say james like it's it's it, it, makes, it, it makes it real yeah it makes it real yeah. it makes it makes it alive i think that it's definitely star wars and and alien to some degree those were sort of the the pioneers of dirty science fiction yeah. Like have have lived in science fiction, and so so impactful were they that that has sort of shifted to our default perception of science fiction now. It's yeah. right. it's unusual right. to see pristine science fiction, you know, very That's clean. Very true. Um, yeah. And Look at Firefly, That's yeah, very dirty. Yeah, uh, and Lord yeah, of the Rings. Firefly, brilliant. Lord of the Rings, I think, had the same impact as you were talking about for fantasy, where you've you expect now to see fantasy to look very lived in and real and dirty and grimy and kind of feels like it's been there for decades, if not centuries. Yeah. Um, which the folks at Weta Workshop who did the work on Lord of the Rings have in spades. Like they think about, they think about the, the example they always give is not from Lord of the Rings, but from King Kong, from Peter Jackson's King Kong. Mm-hmm. The, the dinosaurs in that, the Tyrannosaurus Rex looking dinosaur has very wide feet and almost comically, like almost comically wide feet when you look at it in full. And they said that, well, we did that because the island is very tectonic and has a lot of shifting landscape and volcanic eruptions. So the dinosaurs have wide feet because they would have evolved that way to balance easier on the balance island. Balance themselves. This, this, is, this is the thought that Weta put into it. So for Lord of the Rings, yeah. every sword, every piece of armor, every building, everything had a story. It had a Every tale Aragorn. to tell. Every Aragorn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that has, again, it, so now when you see clean, pristine fantasy, it somehow feels wrong because it's yeah. so ingrained like, in our culture that Lord of the Rings yeah. is the way fantasy looks. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. And obviously Game of Thrones, as you said, James, did that in spades too. It was oh, yeah. very lived in, very grimy, very very medieval sort of esque and, yeah. and I'm I'm wondering what is what is an example of clean fantasy that hasn't held up? I guess the new Lord of the Rings show on Amazon. It was, was too clean. Those. It was, yeah. it was too a little clean. too clean. They tried. They tried. They had the budget to do it, but it just like I've seen comparisons between like the armor designs from yeah. Lord of the Rings versus and that bad, show, and it, bad casting as well. Like yeah, that, the, the one who played mm. the one who played Kate Blanchett's character, the main character, Galadriel. Yeah, Galadriel. Says wasn't that wasn't Galadriel. I was like, it was. Like, it was hey, very Kate Blanchett's flat. like an absolute babe, like, and she's and she <laughs> carries herself and she carries herself. With a certain like regalness, like and that, like gravitas. Her, yeah, yes. she was like she was there. Her presence was like yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah, this 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 per, this actor's presence wasn't like it was like is she even? I don't, is she? Yeah, even there? I, I, I. But that's the thing. I don't think anyone can potentially. I mean, imagine being cast as mm. a role, a younger version of a role that <laughs> Kate Blanchett originated. For yeah, film, and you're like, yeah. ah, how do you, how do you, how do you do that? No, no, no person on earth, apart from Kate Blanchett herself, could probably do that. They know? should have just cast I, her again and just had her in it. Just, I think the, the problem they've had is she hasn't aged. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> the problem they have as well no. is that the era that they set that it was set in was supposed to be the high fantasy era of yeah. Lord of the Rings yes. history, yeah. where the second age, everything right? was oh, shinier. Yeah, there was everything was right. more hopeful. There was, yeah, it was supposed to be this like beautiful and James, you're right. that they were depicting, but I don't think there's a good way to depict that without. I, I, I imagine at some point in the future, someone will find a way to make that realistic and believable. But I think mm. if it's anything that's too perfect, I think human beings are just instinctively sort of hardwired to be very skeptical of, right. <laughs> I right, it's like the first Matrix, right? It was designed to be a perfect society and world, but oh, yeah, yeah, humans yeah. couldn't accept it; they rejected yeah. it, so they had to take yeah. a world with conflict. Um, I, think that's it, yeah. I mean, it's like a, it's not, like a cheat code, right? So when you put a cheat code into a computer game, as right. soon as you make as soon as you make your computer game perfect and you're really great at it, or you've got unlimited money, you'll pay it for like ten minutes. Then you'll just be it's absolutely boring. bored. It's boring, yeah. It's boring. <laughs> you never play it again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like Mass Effect? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no cheat codes for Mass Effect. So how? So how do you think True. then? So how do you think then? Um, with this in mind, can you translate that into your games, into your world? And if you do, how do you do it? I was just it's... thinking about this because in D and D, if you really think about it, it, I mean the the level of magic and the specificity of these spells basically dictate that nobody. <laughs> If you think about it, nobody would ever really work that hard on anything because there's all you could always just pay a spellcaster to do it much more easily and at far less of a cost, right? And if you it, like in theory, yes, of course the world is alive and there's lots of monsters and cities can be dark and dangerous and dirty, but prestidigitation is a cantrip that everybody knows and that can unsoil any any piece of clothing in seconds. There's no more need for washing. There's no more need for scrubbing the streets. If you can just hire a hedge wizard or a hedge mage to go around and flick their wand literally ad infinium every six seconds to polish whatever you need done. The mending cantrip means that if you spend a minute tracing your finger along any breakage of a small item, it'll fix. So you no longer need cobblers or, or, or at least to certain degrees. Um, if, if you have a magic rich society, if, if magic is readily available to a lot of inhabitants of your world, especially in D and D worlds, I feel like it, it lends itself to a magiocracy where the people who have spell casting are the ones in power because they can accomplish so much with so little effort and so little time. So that's why I try and make spellcasting a little bit more unique and still special in my games, right? Not every Joe and Larry on the street is going to be a hedge wizard that knows yeah. even yeah. your most basic cantrips. Like that's still a relatively rare thing. Looking yeah. at the artwork for the new books, the new D&D books, it very much looks like they are 
playing it that way, JC, where it's, it's a much a very magic prevalent society and everything does look very clean and extravagant and beautiful and sort of the, the at least the, the, the societies and the, the, the cities and yeah. things like that look yeah. very clean and pristine and magical and overbuilt. And um, yeah, it looks like they're leaning in that hard. I think in terms of trying to, to answer Rob's question, in terms of trying to make things grimy and and lived in in your D and D world, uh, I think it, it's probably rote to say it, but kind of look at what Tolkien did with the book. the The minute you you describe something, uh, just give a, a location a name, you know, even if it's a a, a mundane location that won't play mm. a major part in the story. If that location has a name, and somebody gives a brief offhand comment about the history of it, why it fell, or something like that, that presupposes an entire history that you probably haven't written. <laughs> right. But it makes people go, ooh, so wait, what happened to this tower? You know, it, it, you say that a band of roving orcs came down from them. Like, how long ago was that? When did that happen? And mm -hmm. it makes the world suddenly feel very much more lived in because yeah. a place that's just somewhere you're passing has an entire history to it. And, and I'm not for any stretch of the imagination suggesting that you write a history for every every location that you let your players get to, but just those little offhand suggestions, like having a, a an NPC mention something from years ago that they did. You know, yeah. I remember when, or, you know, I remember the last time we had a problem with a displacer beast in town. And it immediately makes them feel like they've been around for a long time yeah nice. they have a history right um rather than just they're experiencing this for the first time and it, it's all brand new it, it makes them feel brand new in some ways yeah totally yeah. there was something yeah. i read once which i thought was really good advice to make your location seem fantastical make every you know major location that your players are visiting during a, an adventure interesting and to do that, you could do it one of two ways, either make it big as an exaggeratedly large or make it old. And with the making it old, it lent itself to this credence that there was once something which is no longer around that was either better or worse than your current society. So either, you know, oh, it was a fantastic society where we achieved all kinds of potentially incredible magical things that are no longer available to us or it was this evil empire and we have to stop the remnants of it from returning to the world because it led to an apocalypse that reset all of civilization to the point where we have to have rebuilt it to where it's up to today so yeah it's yeah. it's luke saying wait you fought in the clone wars yeah right right george lucas did it brilliantly as well just having an um Another, I, we were just talking about it before we came on, Dune does a really great job of this as well, where there is this feeling every when you're watching Star Wars, when you're reading Dune, when you're reading or watching Lord of the Rings, there's this feeling that a, a huge amount of stuff has already happened. Yeah. And it takes you a f a f maybe a few reads or a, a few minutes or a few chapters or whatever it is to get round some of the lingo that they're using, some of the, the names and the places, because you don't know them yet, but the characters do. The characters know what uh, the Chome Company yeah, is. You're, you're just along for the ride. Yeah, right. so they mention, oh, you know, we've got shares in Chome, and you go, wait a minute, Chome, have I missed something? Uh, what's that? And over time, in context, you learn what that means. Um, and all three of those products, and many, many more, I'm sure, but well, those are the three examples I can think of just feel like you've come in halfway through the story. Um, yeah. And that's a great way of, of yeah. giving a sense of place in the world is feeling like you've walked in halfway through. Uh, Someone described yeah. it once as like the, a window writing, as if you are an observer, either if you're reading a book or watching a movie, you are an observer watching through a window into a world that is very different from yours. And it, you're not handheld. You're not carefully explained what everything is. You're not being led on a little tour of the new area. And there's, not, I don't think that I've ever read anything or seen anything where you, it originates 
a new society. It doesn't, it doesn't really seem that interesting. There's always something to build off of, at least in mm. the sci-fi and fantasy genres, right? So it, the, the more that it feels, or, or the more history that a place has, the more it feels realistic to you, the more mm. you're able to buy into it. Oh, they're coming yeah, for me. I'll give you the face. <laughs> Sorry, that's my window. Sorry about that. <laughs> they're coming for Rob. They're coming for me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I've just found my internet history. Uh -oh. <laughs> he's, he's escaped and he's back on the podcast. Get him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, a, that's, that's those are really good ideas because it's it makes a lot of sense um, to have that in a game because, like, the amount of times that you know you start players into a game, I, I don't know if you guys have ever done this before, where you have characters um, that are being played by obviously player characters, and they begin the game, and they have already made decisions that you've decided that they have already made that have brought them to the position where they're in. Yes, which is yeah. when they when the the players around you now take over those characters based on the decisions that you've already determined that they've made. Like for example, um, they are in a jail cell. Yeah, they start the game in a jail cell. They start the very first session. They're in. They're in jail. They're like, the classic what? Elder Scrolls start. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. You're like, what the hell am I doing in jail? And it's like that straight away is like, there's a whole load of backstory there right for you. You know. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think my well. my go to for that is uh, tends to be there was a snowstorm. You have all found yourself in the nearest, warmest, driest tavern. Please, <laughs> the, the, the hateful eight, and that is why you're there. Yeah. <laughs> hateful eight entry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like but, that. Yeah, that's why you're not outside camping. You've all had to make your way to somewhere that is warm because you. That's can't the get ice. That's outside. the Icewind Dale start as well, isn't it? That's the start of Icewind Dale, I think, isn't it? Is that uh, sort of, sort of it. it it, on a grander scale, you don't, you, you're not necessarily, unless you choose to start it that way, you're not necessarily all confined to one location. It's you sort of confined to Icewind Dale per se due to that's the, right. the, yeah. the, the thing that's happening. What is the official start? I, I forget a because cold, I kind of wrote uh, my own thing. Uh, tongue in cheek, a, a cold open. Um, right. What was <laughs> that? Yeah. Which is, um, it, so it's, I actually really like the setup. So minor spoilers for Icewind Dale. Uh, right Literally at the beginning of the campaign. Um, right. But it gives you two sort of quote-unquote main path quests and then sprinkles all of the ten towns with their own mini quests. Yeah. Which yeah. So you're supposed to try and follow the, the main quest, which right. one of which is to solve a murder. Oh, yes. yes. And one oh, of which yeah, is yeah. to find a magical creature. So That's you right. can go combat, non-combat. And then through doing that, as you, uh, the, the theory being that through doing that, you then start picking up rumors and or crossing through the yeah. different 10 towns and gathering these other quests like markers on a, on a RPG map, on a video game, and right. then slowly build on those, which then some of them will fuel into the main story again and lead you back in that direction, while others are just designed to help you level up. Um, it's, it's a lovely... Very Sefic, Sefic Caltro. How could I forget about yeah, you? How I'm could you sorry. forget? <laughs> blue eyed, blue eyed boy, Sefic Caltro. Like? I love him. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, that guy was the bane of my player's existence <laughs> for a little while. They hated him. <laughs> yeah, so they should. So they should. Is he the mass yeah. murderer? He's the mass murderer, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, spoilers. 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 Actually, come to think of it, James, I think I started kind of like yours. So I added a little bit of content to the to the front of it, but I basically was like, um, you you know, from the perspective of a of a hawk flying above a snowy tundra, it enters a thin mountain pass, and that's where it sees your party below. And you know, I had each of them describe, and then. Um, you've been on the road from Luskin, I think it was, for several days. You finally crossed through the pass in the spine of the world. Icewind Dale is just a day ahead, but the storms have been picking up lately, and you're going to need to take shelter from this winter weather in the nearest cave. And from there, I had them do a little bit of exploring. But when they got there, ultimately, I had them do the Suffolk Couch. So I'm, I'm quite excited because our home game is due to finish its current run this year, and we've all decided that Icewind Dale will be the framework for our next campaign Ooh. they want to play Icewind Dale um, and what I've decided to do for each of them is each of them are going to have a, a, their own session their own single one-on-one -on -one session 
Um, in their own, because most of them live in Icewind Dale. Oh, some of them have arrived later and then subsequently right. got trapped there. Um, but each of them will have their own little mini quest, which will, in some cases, introduce them to NPCs that will be important later. Um, in, in other cases, will set up their backstory uh, and lead them. And each one will lead them to where they will all meet. So each one will end in a way nice. that forces, sort of, not forces, but heavily suggest they go to a location that will put them all together. Um, From jungle to tundra. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So intense. It's fun. I, I like Icewind. I like Icewind. I think it's one of Ooh. the, one of the better really adventures, at least, yeah. at least the, the Icewind Dale portion, like the 10 towns. That's very, very well put together with a bit of tweaking. You can really make that place feel crazy lived in. It's a really good I, horror. I really liked one, it throughout. It? Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. It can be. And I really like the ending because, again, I find ancient civilizations fascinating. So, like, yeah. if you're exploring something that's foreign and alien, it feels it's like there's something new to learn every corner, you know. Nice. Um, but, yeah. hey, at the end of the day, some people just want a tavern to go pretend to drink some fantasy <laughs> meat in. And I think my Icewind Dale party came across their name um literally in the first or maybe second session when they got to the tavern we had one guy who was just super into it and um he was passing around some pipe weed in the tavern and getting everybody to try it and when they asked him they're like what is this he's like oh yeah that's some good gnome shit and that's the party's name of the gnome shits was born <laughs> <laughs> none of them are gnomes Eat. which is interesting but <laughs> nice yeah. nice well so um news damien what we got, what we yes got? yeah so um there is uh, an apologies up front because we did mention it previously that we were looking at doing a bonus episode regarding all of the new rules yeah. from the player's handbook it happened it did happen <laughs> it, uh, it did. did actually occur sadly uh due to some technical issues it doesn't look like that that episode is gonna mm. is gonna make the life of the day. lost files the lost files yeah, right so maybe <laughs> especially now that we've got even more information to go at, maybe we would be able to get a second go at that and, and do a full rundown. So apologies for that if you were if you were looking forward to that. Uh, that is dominating <laughs> the news, really, TTRPG-wise at the minute, so we won't be yeah. going into that in, in epic detail. But we have had um, most of the classes, if not all of them, have had a dedicated video. Um, yeah. We do know what all of the classes and the subclasses are, um, for the book, all I think it's forty-eight of them. Um, there's a, a page dedicated oh, to showing what they all are. Yeah. So, barbarian, bard, cleric, druid, fighter, monk, paladin, ranger, rogue, sorcerer, warlock, wizard. Sorry, no artificers here. Um, and then Ooh. each of them has a collection of subclasses. Some of them are not surprising at all. Some of them have some surprising omissions. Some of them, some of them are mm. missing some subclasses that I'm surprised not to see in in the main book. You mean like um, the wizard? The yeah. Wizard. Well, they've yeah, kept yeah. it to four each, haven't they? So essentially, the wizard one has been cut in half. Yeah. Um, you know, we we made a big deal about how uh, uh, in the secret episode that will possibly never air. Um, we we made a big deal about them. Oh yeah. 40 something subclasses or 40 subclasses now really really a lot and then i looked it up and i compared it to apparently the 117 subclasses that there are <laughs> for 5e right now and i'm like oh if you think about it it's actually not that much yeah oh, wow, okay yeah the ones i so say some of the ones they've chosen not to include are, are surprising uh, some of the monk ones the wizard there's some missing that you think ah i hope that doesn't stay away for too long um, any any added for Ranger at all? Because I think Ranger's yes. kind of the oh, Ranger's been given uh, buffs a lot of love. Board, uh, Ranger is, Ranger a lot might of as well be a new might as well be a new class because yeah, it's yeah. been completely ground up rewritten. Really you needed it for a long time. Yeah, it did. I always I always feel so Besides. sorry for Ranger players when they're playing Rangers and they suddenly and they suddenly realise they get to like level five and they're like, oh okay. <laughs> this is this is what i am it's like yeah it's like am i in a forest no you're not you're in the mountains oh shit <laughs> well totally yeah. unrelated to classes there is one bit of news that i've i've heard um that is exciting and that is that all the like artisan tools and kits and things mm -hmm. like that now have a specific use yes. like an, an ability each of them yeah. has been given an ability so you don't have to like 
try can and work I out exactly a, can i do this with it a leather working tool so. to uh, check to skin this panther that i found yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it definitely it also tells you what skills would be attributed to it like skills and attributes are yeah. attributed to using it especially with the yeah. the uh, artisan tools um and all of it has been designed to coincide with the crafting the new crafting rules for the book, yes. which allows players to craft uh, all the things you would imagine with each of the artisans' tools, as well as uh, healing potions and scrolls, which will be available to buy in the base equipment uh, mm -hmm. book this yeah. time round, and also craftable where any other magic items, the crafting rules will be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And they're yeah. all designed to work together. So crafting plus those rules that uh, James has pointed out for each it each item now has a rule, a thing you can do with it. It was a really strange timing. My housemate, uh, I've agreed to run a D&D &D, uh, game for him, his friend and his, and his girlfriend. And he was making his like first ever D&D &D character. And he got to D&D &D Beyond. He got to the point where there's a drop down for all the, all the tools. It was like, does it make any difference what I pick here? And I was sort of like, no, not really like <laughs> mm. Mm. you'd have to use like quite a bit of artistic license to get any use out of most of them unless it's a very right. obvious thing like obviously if you have a drum and you're proficient with drumming then you can make your character drum it it very much felt it. like it's very much a role-playing yeah it, it felt almost yeah. it felt almost like that list of of equipment was there because it's been there since the first edition for, mm. for the almost like for like for the most part it's it's you know 10 foot pole and caltrips and all these things that were from the original game of you are going through 10 by 10 dungeons <laughs> yeah um yeah. Mm -hmm. and they were just there because hey remember this is still D, D. whereas the game we've said before now has shifted dramatically from being just that uh to a, a much more grand a, and yeah uh, it's a mix isn't it? role play of, heavy of different things uh, uh, yeah one one size fits all game uh so it's nice to see that that list is no longer a, a, a somewhat redundant list unless you come up with a really clever idea um and it has yeah. actual rules to it i hope they won't be too restrictive i'm sure they won't be but it's nice that they have use <laughs> no. yeah but i think for new players especially as well if they can look and see oh oh that's what that does yeah right or oh, that's the benefit of me like taking uh, calligraphy tools or whatever, I can forge these specific documents. With, yeah, with maps. Or... They've said, uh, yeah. they said, the they actually yeah. called that out in the video. Uh, calligraphy tools are there, but you can't, th there isn't a map to buy. Um, so they've added maps as, a, as a, a thing you can buy. They've attributed a cost to it. Uh, and then calligraphy tools, of course, can be, uh, uh, not ca cartographer's tools, sorry. Cartographer. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. thinking mm. cartographer's tools. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, very nice to, to to see that the equipment will have use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will, aside, will um, will they be updating the the um, the DM screen? Oh well, funny. Yes. That's yeah. We'll get to that. I've got that on the list. Sweet. Um, <laughs> just here. Here's a question: Will they be updating skills? I don't know if I've come across any news about that. I haven't the, heard the anything list. specifically yeah. regarding skills. Right. Maybe that's an upcoming video. It feels like that would fit a video if they're going to do it. They've done, I think, all of all of the main classes now. They've done spells and talked a lot about spells. So there's a whole video dedicated right. to spells, um, most of which is just they've been tweaked and updated, lots yeah. more artwork yeah. to depict them. Um, there's one for crafting, which is very short yep. and talks about what we've just we've covered there, uh, me and James. Yep. Um, yep. So if they're going to do anything with skills, they've already mentioned feats kind of throughout. Video. Yeah. Feats are quite different, mentioned throughout various of the videos, but skills, not really. Mm. Not, not really. I, I, I always find that there is, I feel like there's a lack of some skills. And I know they were trying to parse it down from previous editions, but there are certain things like streetwise or use magical object or things like this that I feel like are missing a particular skill and you could make an argument that they fit into a into a different category but sometimes I feel like that should be something specific that you put more focus in and I didn't want to start doing that as a homebrew rule because there's no way to edit a digital character sheet you know um Anyway, I just it's always been one of those things that kind of grinds my gears. I'm like, oh, there's I know so that... many good skills in 3.5 that I would have still loved to have. 
I know that some of the classes that aren't uh, aren't uh, rogues can now have expertise in certain skills. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to to give them that boost in. Well, you would actually know this if you were this class. Wizards, for example, will have a uh, chance to take expertise in things like Arcana. Um, history. To give them, yeah. yeah, history, to give them a boost, not just a, a base stat boost, but an actual full boost to that skill. Yeah. So I know they've said that much, um, but not much else yet. All right. I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but I can't. But I know that they have. There are quite often instances in games where someone's like, "Hey, can I try and do this thing?" And I'm like, "Yeah, let me try and work out which ability <laughs> uh, mm. that you would use to to do that." Sure, which sure, that, all the time, all the time. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, maybe a bonus episode upcoming. Look forward to that. And also, if you want to watch these videos, they are all over D and D's YouTube channel. There's a load of them. Uh, they're worth they're worth listening to if you're interested in in these types of things because they are pretty informative on what you can expect from the new uh, the new revised books. Um, there has just been a reveal of the uh, the dungeon master's screen. Now it doesn't show what's on it or particularly say what's on it in terms of our side of the screen, GM side of the screen. Um, it shows the artwork and it says that it's been redesigned. Um, I think that's really about as much as we've got. Mm. Uh, it's been designed based on feedback to, to be more useful. Um, I'm I'm going to be that guy. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like the artwork on it. Return of negative ninny. Return. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, the negative ninny says, uh, no, I, I, I don't. It's, it's not a bad piece of artwork. I just, again, it doesn't... I don't know. The GM screen should in my eyes, be something that sort of feels like the beginning of an adventure or, or something scenic or thematic to you. You know, I always like when they released screens for this particular games because it gave a thematic kind of twist to... For those adventures, yeah. For that adventure. Um, this is just all... It looks like all of the classes just all sort of yeah. stood. It's a kind of... This is probably the worst example I could give for this, but it's the first thing that came to my mind. It's almost a a standing last supper of all the classes. It's just all of them. Oh, I see it. Okay. Looking at I hadn't each seen other. Before. Um, and then there's a, dra- there's sort of a dragon in the middle and a, and a D 20. It's yeah. Like a what, what do you guys, like what do you guys think? Or something, whatever that is. I, I hadn't seen to, this, but now I see it. Yeah. I have to agree. Uh, I, I think that, and for me personally, my, if I'm going to use a DM screen, I want one that, sort of thematically maybe add something to the table for the players with the art work, which I don't think this does. It doesn't sort of put you in a, a setting or an environment that you can use. So like even the, the very basic like Red Dragon one from, from 5e, the original one, that's yeah. great. Um because it yeah, it's very, very thematic and uh having sort of uh, a screen with like a layer of cloud and, and stuff and this red dragon emerging from it. Is quite good and, and, and abstract and you can sort of get a sense of scale and right. those players sort of in the world a little bit. Uh, same with the Castle Ravenloft one, where it's sort of looking up at Castle Ravenloft. I think that I think that's probably my favourite DM screen. Yeah. Although I think the Icewind Dale one's pretty cool as well. Yeah. Um but yeah, the yeah, the Barovia one, um, which I can't remember if it came out with Curse of Strahd or if it came out with Van Richten's. Um but one of those. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's that's my preference anyway for DM screen. I mean, if the information on the back of it is useful, then like I imagine it will get plenty of use regardless. But yeah, cool. I yeah. I see it for the first time, Rob. What do you think now that I post um, the the link? I think I just want a DM screen that just has the basics that you want, really, just just to help you out. Uh-huh. Um, it's it's interesting isn't it? because you don't want to have a dm screen that is too kind of you know matches what you've already got with with what already already exists with what mm. we have you know it tells you your your actions tells you what um you know this means or that means or whatever and it just it'd be nice to see like the different schools of magic perhaps broken down what they all are um mm. just just when to do certain checks on certain things will give you an example of when to use certain tools, maybe if like right. or or prompts to kind of help your players along. I don't know. It's a. I've always wanted 
Um, I'll, I'll tell you the things I've always wanted on a DM screen, and some of them have them, some of them don't. Um, the AC for uh, different kinds of objects, so like wood, metal, glass, that sort of stuff, right? That comes up all the time. Like, hey, I want to break down the door, or I'd like to smash the window, or like, okay, make an attack roll. Oh, what's the AC of glass? You know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I've always wanted improvise you know there's a list in the dmg a table that says um improvising damage and it gives you a handful of examples like being fully submerged in lava is 18 d10 fire damage um whereas falling rocks from an avalanche is like 12 d6 or something whatever it may be mm. i love that table i wish i could have it more often on a dm screen um there's always been uh not just those but also oh the um the size of different objects and stuff love those kinds of rules the ones that you don't know off the top of your head but yeah. they come up all the time anyway that's the stuff i really yeah. always wanted what about what about you guys the ones that are buried yeah the ones that are buried deep in a book um that just aren't easy to memorize versus other rules that you just want to they come up a lot though like those examples you've just given that you just need to get quick access to um i i have over the years looked at ones that other people have created uh, one one that i found really helpful was a guide price on magical items yes. based on yes. based yeah. on yeah. their sort of rarity and things like that uh, that's really uh, helpful uh, in a pinch yeah, cool. you've got that sudden shot shopping episode that came out of nowhere uh, and they're flush with flush with gold and want to go shopping for magic items um Oh God, a, please, uh, please send me the link to that. <laughs> a base guide price, I will. A, a base guide price for, for magic items is really sort of a, a from this to this as well. It's not just a flat price, which is really right. helpful because then you can think, okay, so that's the low end, that's the high end. Um, yeah, really, really helpful. That's that's one example I can think of straight away. I would, I would really like, it's not a specific thing that I'd want on the DM screen, but what I would like from a DM screen is interchangeable like slots so if each of the four panels yeah. had something you could slide in and out and yep. so before you set yeah, up the game nice. you could slide in the four that you think will come up during that game they'll never do it between sessions mm, no, no, i mean well, really. oh, well i mean wizard of the coast won't they could uh, sell this I they, could sell, they could sell the inserts couldn't they yeah, you literally have, literally yeah. have a blank a blank DM screen and just sell the inserts you could literally Other pick and choose do. based on what kind of DM you are like yeah, if you're yeah, experienced yeah. DM, maybe you want to have that in there. Maybe you want to have this in there. Maybe you want that in there. Oh, we're going to the worlds this time, right? Let's put all the wild stuff in, you know. Yeah. And like oh, that would be that that would be a fucking money maker. All right, Rob. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Well, we'll cut this bit out of the episode, and me and you will we'll have a talk. Yeah. I just need to learn how to yeah, right. uh, do, do a bit of woodwork well, and. Well, uh, well, that's well, what uh, that's def that definitely exists. I think for third parties have definitely done oh, stuff yeah, like yeah. that before. But I think yeah. I think it. If it was an official one from D and D that they did it, they would be they they'd smash it out of the park. Especially if they had like lovely artwork. If the inserts were really customizable, like that'd be so that'd be such a good thing. Like you pay oh, like yeah. pay like thirty quid, and you get a set of inserts for your DM screen that match exactly what you want for your for your, for your yeah. session that you're in, or your, or hope the next couple of sessions that you could be doing. GMs would be all over that. They'd be all over it. Yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. I think I think, I think they're trying idea. to go more towards digital, aren't they? Because it costs them, it, yes. it, it saves their bottom line so much more in print. Well, nice segue. Speaking of sort of the covers of things and and artwork in print, a, a small piece of news, a, a kind of sad piece of news, but not entirely surprising. Um, Joshua M. Smith, also known as Hydro Seventy Four, is has confirmed they will no longer be producing. Uh, no limited edition covers for Dungeons and Dragons. It oh. sounds like Wizards have told them they're going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Digital. Uh, yeah. He did the so, Eye of Vecna special edition he, he cover did. and he, had many it, others. It was that book that actually prompted because he got he received his copy of that book and lauded the, the the sort of quality of it and then said that will that's going to be it. They told me they're going in a different direction. So that's wow. My last book. No, I yeah. love his shame. work. Yeah. yeah, so it's a shame. Um, I'm I'm sure, given the the widespread notoriety, thanks to those books, uh, I would hope Hydro won't have too much trouble finding work. And and uh, you know, and and they they actually did say um, disappointing but freelance life. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, makes makes he does sense, a lot of right? other stuff too. I've been on his yeah, website amazing, once. Amazing gig to get. Designs. 
It is well, an amazing what's, game. What's yeah. What a CV as well. Like that, like saying, "Oh, you know, yeah. I did the special edition books for Dungeons and Dragons." That's my art. Like incredible. They get yeah. snapped right. up. Right. Their, their different. Their different direction is basically AI, probably. Yeah. <laughs> God, or the, you know the car, almost quasi cartoony sort of soft versions of the yeah. covers that we've seen so far. Another another quick one, but a, another bit of a bummer, I'm afraid. Um, Roll Twenty have in just the last couple of days announced publicly that they have had a security breach oh, yeah, of Again? Uh, personal information. Well, it's a um, terrible time to find out about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I I received an email about it from them directly, uh, and then I, I saw a couple of a couple of emails yeah. regarding it. Oh, it doesn't it. sound like, given the scope of people they've got on their books, like it was a massive leak in terms of how many people would have been affected. But if you are a user of uh, Roll Twenty, they would have had access to things like the last few digits of card numbers, right. uh, name, address, nothing. Oh, sh- no, no, no pass. They say no passwords or full card numbers or anything like that would have been accessed, um, and they have stamped it out very quickly according to their report. But um, yeah, if so, if you are a Roll Twenty subscriber and user, just keep just keep an eye for for the next week or two on on your account uh, and obviously your other your bank accounts as well as your Roll Twenty account just in case. Um, Ah, the joke's on them. There's no money in my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a bummer, but a, a bit of a PSA there. So just keep an eye out. Um, last, very last quick couple of bits is three sneak pe- previews. We've got a, a, a sneak preview of the full Greyhawk hex map from Mike Schley. If you, if you know D&D oh, nice. maps, you know Mike Schley. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got a full look at it. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, not a not a huge region, which I really like. It's big, but not not globally big, uh, and that that's nice to have a, a somewhat contained continent to to focus your efforts on. Uh, What's the so name of the continent? Uh, I don't. I, I'm not a big Greyhawk guy. Does it say? Uh, Nah, not, Im- not important. Just no, says just Greyhawk. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have failed you, JC. Um, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. But, yeah, uh, it's it's a lovely map. Yeah, you can you can check it out online. Uh, that's going to be the poster map that presumably will come with the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, really and I think cool. Mike Schley has said that you'll be able to purchase high res versions from from them at a later date, which is typical uh, yeah. of yeah. of them. Uh, we got a sneak peek of the. Designed for the uh, cosmology of D anD D, the the planes of existence in the Barbarian video, uh, with the Outlands and Sigil in the middle, and then the various realms all the way around them. Very simple, very, very simplistic, isometric color artwork uh, of everything from Elysium to Hades to Mechanus to Limbo. Um, very, very simplistic, but does an interesting job of of showing you the cosmology and just sort of a little splash of color and and shape to indicate what that realm is like uh, so for example limbo is uh, limbo and iscard are both floating rocks with swirls in them versus mechanus which is cogs versus mount mm. celestia which is a big old mountain with a cloud around the middle of it um uh acron which is cubes <laughs> it's all floating cubes which is interesting wow uh, so nice to see nice to see that nice to get a look at how they're they're depicting the cosmology here uh, and then finally, oh. a quick sneak peek of Quest from the Infinite Staircase. We got a look. I don't know whether this is a leak or not, but we got a look at the full table. It looks table like of a leak. Yeah, it looks like a leak. Uh, full table of contents for um, Quest from the Infinite Staircase. So all of the adventures, plus the monsters, the creatures in the appendix. Um, There's some interesting well, creatures in there as well. There is. I would say stuff that I didn't expect to be seeing uh, stat blocks of. Ooh. There is, yeah. Seen, like what? What are we Androids? Um, Android, uh, yeah, and, and robots. I mean, that is the the listing, um, but it looks like that's two pages of robots. Yeah, um, and yeah, uh, Vegeta so. Pygmy is in there as well, which is weird because Vegeta Pygmies have already had uh, stat blocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they republish uh, them if they don't appear in the monster manual. Yeah, true. That's I'm intrigued idea. by was that a Volo's guy? If that was clothing? a Volo's guy, I think that makes sense. I think so. Yeah. 
Was Sorry, James. Rollers or Morning Cannons? No, so yeah, so it looks like one of the adventures, um, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, is uh, involves a spaceship. So I'm assuming that's where the robots and the androids are coming uh, yeah. coming in. Yeah, um, that's a cool. there's a Very Pharaoh... popular older module. Yeah, yeah. Pharaoh have you guys, you guys, have you guys ever played 40k and played Necrons? You ever played Necrons? Yes, yes. Well, my brother played Necrons, um, but yes, I am well familiar with them wiping out all my space marines yeah i love they're necrons so, they're so good. i love the you lore st- of the necrons of yeah so they, much, they, yeah. they used to be vampires didn't they or something was that the lore they that well they was? they were a race of somebody, incredibly yeah. sick people because their son was deadly to them um and so they were tricked into getting a shiny new paint uh, job quite literally by being sucked into machines not realizing that it would enslave them um yeah. Uh, and then spent most of their time with these new incredible bodies trying to kill and undo the creatures that tricked them in the first place. Um, so Brilliant. sort of War of the Gods type thing where they just destroyed the cosmos trying to wreak vengeance on the, the god creatures that gave them this metallic metallic body. Very cool. I love the Necrons. <laughs> yeah, they are cool. I like how you shoot them, they get back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just build themselves back up and keep walking. Very, very thematic. I enjoyed that yeah, a lot yeah. less. <laughs> <laughs> I detected a note of sarcasm from Rob there, so yeah. <laughs> um, one thing we got out of uh, Infinite Staircase as well is a stat block for Zargon the Returner, which I don't think has been stat blocked since 3rd edition, um, but a big old oh. uh, aberration... Uh, a big tentacled thing with a single eye, very, very slimy yeah, and monstrous cool. looking. Yeah, very cool looking. Um, so that's presumably the big bad of one of the one of the adventures. I don't know which off the top of my head, but presumably the big bad for one of the the higher level adventures they set at CR. I think the lot. I think the Lost City potentially. Lost City is it? Uh, just because it mentions a ziggurat in the um, in the oh uh, what. Why can I not think of the word for content page? Contents page. Uh, there's the oh, ziggurat and the contents page, and in the artwork for for him, there is a ziggurat in the background. Yes, I think. Right. yeah, very true. I've n- I've never run that um, the Lost City. Oh, I've never I, run I any of these. Of it. I don't think. I think I've heard of Beyond the Crystal Cave. The Crystal Cave yes. sounds. I've, heard, I've certainly heard of all of them. I've never run any of them, but yeah. Barrier Peaks was a very popular one. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Mostly sneak peeks, a little bit of bummer news, and lots and lots and lots and lots of players' handbook news. Uh, yeah, to peruse that. Exciting. Oh, yeah. Cool, cool. Well, um, you guys, I think that's the end of the episode. How are we? We have an hour in exactly. Nice. There you go. Very Dead good on. work. Yeah, cool. Well, um, yeah, it's been a great episode. Nice to be back. Good to see you guys again. Of course. Indeed. Yep. Indeed. Good to have you back. Again. Long, long may it continue this way. Um, yes. Yep. I keep getting these little like, oh, which am I doing this today? Da, 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 da. I'm like, I'm like do you know I've, <laughs> do you realize I've, I have to go to work? It's like, yeah, you know, you've got a son you need to look after and you need to do <laughs> You did, you did no. say that when you go full time in your business, you'll be able to like be hands on so you can have a family. And I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, I did say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did yeah. Say that. yeah. <laughs> uh, see, Rob, that, that was your mistake. You, uh, you said that yeah, right. out loud. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just need to be like, I'm really busy all the time, mm. which, I, which I kind of am. But yeah. Yeah. Right. Hey, ho. Course, no. there you go. It's all good and all fun. All right, guys. Cool. Well, uh, well, we, uh, what's next week? Is anything going on next week? Are you guys all available next week? Uh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What is you've got you've got me for the next day? four, th- ah. oh, sorry, three weeks. Uh, the fourth week, I am in Mexico. Oh. I, I won't be here next week. I'm going to be in Leicester for a meeting. So you guys have to hold the fort. We'll do. The 11th. Cool. That's all right. right you cool. shall be missed. I yeah, shall get my skull crunching weapon out and ready to defend it. <laughs> <laughs> sweet. You go. sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, okay, and, guys. Uh, good luck with your general elections today, guys. Right? Oh, oh yes. That's, that's yeah. today, isn't it? Have you? Oh, have, that's you need vote, to go and do. have you? Have you all voted? No, not yet. No. Not yet. No, no. I will get. I will get there. Cool, cool, cool. I will Make get sure there. you do. Make sure you do. Sweet. All right, guys. Well, thanks again. And you'll hear us in the next one. Ciao, ciao. See you, folks. Ciao. Bye.